Hello, welcome to the Church of St. Luke and St. Matthew and to our service of morning prayer on this fourth Sunday after Epiphany. It's a great pleasure to welcome you here and to encourage you to go through the whole service with us. Uh, hopefully you will find it interesting and also a balm for your soul. Especially pray that you may get to the sermon and find that interesting and thought-provoking as well as we live through these very tumultuous times, Jesus always has something, I think, to teach us. May the Lord bless you this day and all the days that lie before you. I will give you as a light to the nations that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart we have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy upon you. Forgive you all of your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. 
Lord, open our lips, and our mouth shall proclaim your praise. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Come, let us adore him. Be joyful in the Lord, all you lands. Serve the Lord with gladness and come before his presence with a song. Know this, the Lord himself is God. He himself has made us and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving Go into his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and call upon his name. For the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting and his faithfulness endures from age to age. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Come, let us adore him. A reading of Psalm 111. Hallelujah, I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart in the assembly of the upright in the congregation. Great are the deeds of the Lord. They are studied by all who delight in them. His work is full of majesty and splendor and his righteousness endures forever. He makes his marvelous works to be remembered the Lord is gracious and full of compassion. He gives food to those who fear him. He is ever mindful of his covenant. He has shown his people the power of his works in giving them the lands of the nations. The works of his hands are faithfulness and justice. All his commandments are sure. They stand fast forever and ever because they are done in truth and equity. He sent redemption to his people. He commanded his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and those who act accordingly have a good understanding. His praise endures forever. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. A reading from the book of Deuteronomy. Moses said, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own people, you shall heed such a prophet. This is what you requested of the Lord your God at Horeb on the day of the assembly when you said, If I hear the voice of the Lord my God any more, or ever see again this great fire, I will die. Then the Lord replied to me, They are right in what they have said. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their own people. I will put my words in the mouth of the prophet, who shall speak to them everything that I command. Anyone who does not heed the words that the prophet shall speak in my name, I myself will hold accountable. But any prophet who speaks in the name of other gods, or who presumes to speak in my name a word that I have not commanded the prophet to speak, that prophet shall die. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You are God, we praise you. You are the Lord, we acclaim you. You are the eternal Father. All creation worships you. To you, all angels, all the powers of heaven, cherubim and seraphim sing in endless praise. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. The glorious company of apostles praise you. The noble fellowship of prophets praise you. 
the white-robed army of martyrs praise you. Throughout the world, the Holy Church acclaims you. Father of majesty unbounded, your true and only Son, worthy of all worship and the Holy Spirit, advocate and guide. You, Christ, are the King of glory, the eternal Son of the Father. When you became man to set us free, you did not shun the virgin's womb. You overcame the sting of death and opened the kingdom of heaven to all believers. You are seated at God's right hand in glory. We believe that you will come and be our judge. Come then, Lord, and help your people, bought with the price of your own blood, and bring us with your saints to glory everlasting. A reading from the first letter of Paul to the Corinthians. Now concerning food sacrificed to idols, we know that all of us possess knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. Anyone who claims to know something does not yet have the necessary knowledge, but anyone who loves God is known by him. Hence, as to the eating of food offered to idols, we know that no idol in the world really exists and that there is no God but one. Indeed, even though there may be so-called gods in heaven or on earth, as in fact there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is one God, the Father, from whom are all things and from for whom we exist, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we exist. It is not everyone, however, who has this knowledge. Since some have become so accustomed to idols until now, they still think of the food they eat as food offered to an idol, and their conscience, being weak, is defiled. Food will not bring us close to God. We are no worse off if we do not eat, and no better off if we do. But take care that this liberty of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. For if others see you, who possess knowledge, eating in the temple of an idol, might they not, since their conscience is weak, be encouraged to, point to the point of eating food sacrificed to idols? So by your knowledge, those weak believers for whom God died are destroyed. But when you thus sin against members of your family and wound their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if food is a cause of their falling, I will never eat meat so that I may not cause one of them to fall. The Word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. O ruler of the universe, Lord God, great deeds are they that you have done, surpassing human understanding. Your ways are ways of righteousness and truth, O king of all the ages. Who can fail to do you homage, Lord, and sing the praises of your name, for you only are the Holy One. All nations will draw near and fall down before you because your just and holy works have been revealed. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. Amen. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Mark. Jesus and his disciples went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, he entered the synagogue and taught. They were astounded at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Just then, there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? 
Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, convulsing him and crying with a loud voice, came out of him. They were all amazed, and they kept on asking one another, What is this? A new teaching with authority. He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. At once, his fame began to spread throughout the surrounding region of Galilee. The Gospel of the Lord. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The story that is our Gospel reading today is one of the first told of Jesus' encounter with unclean or evil spirits. Mark's Gospel being the first and the earliest of the uh, four synoptic Gospels. The so-called unclean spirit shows itself in a man who has come into the synagogue where Jesus is teaching. And the account zooms in on this very personal encounter between Jesus, the man and the spirit. When we hear this story told almost 2,000 years later, our understanding of unclean spirits is probably different from those in the synagogue that day. Post-enlightenment, humanity is now largely influenced by science. And the irony of that statement is not lost on me. For those that do believe in science and what science tells us about the world, our experience of someone who might exhibit the effects of unclean spirits is probably someone who has a mental health condition, bipolar or schizophrenia, perhaps. Spiritual matters are very different to scientific matters. So if we do interpret, interpret this story in the 21st century from a scientific basis, then I feel we miss the real impact. Spiritual might be defined as a dimension of our humanity that is relational first to one's environment holistically, but especially to other people, and of course to God, whose relationship with us is the purest form of relationship, made possible by pure love. Human relationships have of course existed since Adam and Eve, and anthropology is the study of humankind, and by extension, human relationships. An anthropo uh, anthropological philosopher named René Girard has written extensively at the intersection of anthropology, ethics, and theology. In seminary, I was introduced to his writings on human development that occurs through a process of observational mimicry. It's called mimetic theory, or the study of how children desire by copying adult behaviors, fundamentally linking acquisition of identity, knowledge, and material wealth to the development of a desire to have something others possess. Girard believed that all human conflict, competition, and rivalry emanated from this very human characteristic of mirroring of others, a desire of others. The concept of scapegoating evolves out of this understanding when someone can't obtain what they desire, they can project their anger or frustration onto another person, citing them as the reason that their desire has not been fulfilled. And we all know scapegoats and how they have been unfairly ostracized from families and society because they have been labeled as the cause of some perceived problem or other or problems. Mimetic theory helps to explain some of the dy dynamics of human relationships and how they become transcendent into social systems and cultures. We are, of course, all born into spiritual and cultural realities and nurtured in them, generally in family units. The way we are raised is fundamental to our own human development. It has been very helpful to me to use mimetic theory when trying to understand the many ways human culture plays out in the various relationships contained in our scriptural stories. 
The story we heard about Jesus and the man with the unclean spirit is, I believe, a story of human relationships. First, the relationship between the man and Jesus, and also the relationship between the man and his religious and social communities. The scribes mentioned in the story were the teachers in the synagogue hierarchy. They taught the Torah. They were educated men and steeped in the law and carried with them a defined sense of authority. They were the learned men after all. Priests on the other hand had the responsibility for worship and liturgy and ensuring the faithful adhered to the law. And if they hadn't adhered to the law, that they carried out the correct rituals to ensure that they were purified before entering the temple once again. We are told in the story that Jesus walked into the synagogue one Sabbath and began to teach. And naturally his teaching was compared to the teaching of the scribes. Lo and behold, there was a noticeable difference. It was so different that it made a distinct impression on his newest friends, those four disciples that left their fishing and went after him immediately. But it also probably had a big impact on the general worshippers that were there as witnesses as well. Just as, Je uh, just as Jesus was teaching, we are told that a man with an unclean spirit was in the temple and approached him. What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Two things to note in this exchange. The first is that the man knew who Jesus was, despite this being the beginning of his ministry. And the second was that Jesus did not immediately deny it. Rather, Jesus rebuked the spirit and called it out of the man leaving him convulsing on the floor. When the man entered the synagogue, he was ritually unclean because of the spirit that possessed him. Therefore, he would have been shunned by the other worshippers and barred from worshipping until he made himself pure. When Jesus healed this man, he made an impact not only on the man's life, but also on the community, including those four, Andrew, Simon, Peter, James, and John, who were with him. They were amazed, we are told. In this story, Jesus does not represent the priest, a person who we might understand to guide people to becoming pure. Quite the opposite, in fact. Jesus is expelling the collective attitude that the man is unclean, when it is the spirit of the judgmental crowd that has declared the man unclean. They have made him a scapegoat. By casting out the spirit, Jesus makes the man clean so that he might re-enter the community, if the community, of course, is willing to accept Jesus' healing of him. And remember, we are considering relationships in this story. And we can see that Jesus is giving the community an opportunity to be healed along with the man. The community would be healed if they renounced violent rivalry that scapegoats the other. But first, as we know, healing only begins when there is acknowledgement of the wrongs rather than exuberance and excitement of the prior action of shunning. And we can find contemporary examples of this biblical story in society if we look at relationship issues with humankind. An example of what happens to people in communities can be found in the actions of one man who participated in the insurrection at the Capitol on January the 6th. And his story really stuck with me. You've probably all seen and read about the insurrection, a monumental historic moment in the Republic. You would know that the day started with a rally on the eclipse where the former president and others rallied against the election result, denied that they had lost 
and stirred up the crowd to go to the capital to fight for stopping the certification. We also know only too well that the crowd took that call to heart. They marched on the capital and they broke through the flimsy police cordon and broke in. Many of them had evil intent to kidnap or to kill some of the politicians. Others just wanted to stop the certification. And many others just got carried up in the exuberance of the crowd. One man who made it inside the capital was a young man named Cleet Keller. Cleet Keller was a former Olympic gold medalist from the Athens and the Beijing Olympics. He was easy to spot because he was six foot six tall and he wore his USA team jacket. Now it seems to me that wearing such a recognizable jacket was either foolhardy or a sign that he wanted to be known as an Olympian and maybe revealing something of a fragile character. After the Olympics, it's been reported that Mr. Keller had a lot of trouble adjusting to retirement. And many elite athletes do struggle to find themselves once they leave the heavily structured world of training and competing. His marriage broke down and he became divorced. He lost his job and he became homeless, sleeping in his car. It has also been reported that many of his teammates and coaches knew his life was unraveling and his politics was divisive. But they said they were still very surprised to see him in the crowd at the Capitol. And that what was very telling to me about his story was his reaction the next day when he spoke by phone with his former coach, Mark Schubert. Mr. Schubert is reported to have said of Keller's call, he apologized to me. He kept repeating, you've done so much for me and I let you down. He kept saying it over and over. I didn't mean for any of this to happen. Keller clearly regretted his actions. And this is how mimetic desire happens. Keller was caught up in a large event and was almost powerless to stop being carried along by the crowd right up the steps and into the rotunda. His words of regret to his former coach reveal a person swept up in the day, willingly going along with something that in his gut probably told him he was wrong. His shadow side, his inner dark spirit, increased his desire to copy what others were doing and followed them. Like the man in today's gospel story with the unclean spirit, Cleet Keller has been disowned by his community, his former teammates, the US Olympic Committee, his employer, and no doubt some of his family and friends. His unclean spirit separated him from his community. Keller's response was clear contrition and regret. His sober assessment of his actions might be the catalyst for change in his life, to find new purpose away from the cult-like following of the former president. He might find renewed purpose in relationships with his family, his former teammates and others. If he does, and if the community in which he lives and works accepts his sentiments of contrition, he would have overcome the evil force, his unclean spirits that drove him from those that he loves in the first place. And of course, he would have a compelling story of redemption to tell. If his community does not accept him, then they are acting with the same unclean spirits, making him a scapegoat for the actions that day and for the divisive nature of political life. But this would not be representative of what Jesus is teaching us in the story today. Jesus' healing of the man with the unclean spirit helped turn the man from a life shunned by his community to one where he would be embraced once again. Because the synagogue community was witness to the healing power of Jesus' words, it too took a step forward to becoming a more compassionate and loving community, 
recognizing that healing from past behavior, healing from our own unclean spirits, is a way of building community and not breaking community down. Have you come to destroy us, the unclean spirit asked Jesus. No, Jesus did not come to destroy anything, except maybe the culture of the community that was already destroying him and others. Now we know that the former president has developed a cult-like following and he drew enormous power and satisfaction by pulling in vulnerable people like Cleek Keller with his divisive rhetoric. He revealed to us all the danger of mimetic desire, groupthink, and the power of wanting to belong. He essentially played to the unclean spirits in so many people. Jesus came not just to heal individuals, but to heal all of us who reside in communities of family and friends. He came to save us from perpetuating violence against others, such as the lost and the marginalized and those who suffer with often untreated mental health issues. Jesus came to save us from being people that prosper by destroying and shunning others. If Jesus can heal us, we as his body on earth can help to heal others. However, we must always be aware of and own our own unclean spirits. When we acknowledge our own unclean spirits, we can begin to heal, or we can begin the process of healing. Jesus stands always ready to call out our unclean spirits. If only we ask him. Amen. Let us recite together the Apostles' Creed, Lord's Prayer and Suffrages. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Save your people, Lord, and bless your inheritance. Govern and uphold them now and always. Day by day we bless you. We praise your name forever. Lord, keep us from all sin today. Have mercy on us, Lord, have mercy. Lord, show us your love and mercy for we put our trust in you. In you, Lord, is our hope, and we should never hope in vain. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, you govern all things both in heaven and on earth. 
mercifully hear the supplications of your people and in our time grant us your peace through Jesus Christ our Lord who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit one God forever and ever amen O God you make us glad with the weekly remembrance of the glorious resurrection of your son our Lord give us this day such blessing through our worship of you that the week to come may be spent in your favour through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. O God, the author of peace and lover of concord, to know you is eternal life and to serve you is perfect freedom. Defend us, your humble servants, in all assaults of our enemies, that we, surely trusting in your defence, may not fear the power of any adversaries, through the might of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us pray. Father, we pray for your holy Catholic Church, that we all may be one. Grant that every member of the Church may truly and humbly serve you, that your name may be glorified by all people. We pray for all bishops, priests, and deacons, that they may be faithful ministers of your word and sacraments. We pray for all who govern and are hold authority in the nations of the world, that there may be justice and peace on the earth. Give us grace to do your will in all that we undertake, that our works may find favour in your sight. Have compassion on those who suffer from any grief or trouble, that they may be delivered from their distress. Give to the departed eternal rest. Let light perpetual shine upon them. We praise you for your saints who have entered into joy. May we also come to share in your heavenly kingdom. Let us pray now for our own needs and for those of others. Lord Jesus Christ, you sent your own apostles. Peace I give to you, my own peace I leave with you. Regard not our sins, but the faith of your church, and give to us the peace and unity of that heavenly city, where with the Father and the Holy Spirit you live and reign now and forever. Amen. Kind-hearted and the 
Let us now pray together the prayer of general thanksgiving. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, your unworthy servants, give you humble thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness to us and to all whom you have made. We bless you for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life, but above all for your immeasurable love in the redemption of the world through our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. And we pray, give us such an awareness of your mercies that with truly thankful hearts, we may, not show, we may show forth your praise, not only with our lips, but in our lives, by giving up ourselves to your service and by walking before you in holiness and righteousness all our days. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honour and glory throughout all ages. Amen. Almighty God, you have given us grace at this time with one accord to make our common supplications to you. And you have promised through your well-beloved Son that when two or three are gathered together in his name, you will be in the midst of them. Fulfill now, O Lord, our desires and petitions as may be best for us, granting us in this world knowledge of your truth and in the age to come, life everlasting. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. May Almighty God, who led the wise men by the shining star to find the Christ, the light from light, lead you also in your pilgrimage to find the Lord. Amen. May God, who sent the Holy Spirit to rest upon the only begotten at his baptism in the Jordan River, pour out that Spirit on you who have come to the waters of new birth. Amen. May God, by the power that turned water into wine at the wedding feast at Cana, transform your lives and make glad your hearts. Amen. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you this day and remain with you forever. Amen.